welcome to RCA Radio, a podcast where we cover the latest news and challenges in regulatory, compliance, and quality assurance facing the life science industries. I'm your host, Brandon Miller. In this episode of RCA Radio, we'll be taking a look at what's happening in the pharmaceutical industry in 2023 and provide you with some insight in how you can prepare yourself for these upcoming initiatives. Today, I'm joined by Stephen Lin and Susan Snape. Steve is RCA's Executive Pharmaceutical Consultant, and Sue is the Chair of PDA as well as Distinguished Fellow at RCA. Welcome, Steve and Sue. Thanks, Brandon. Um, I know there's a lot happening in 2023, so let's just jump right into it. Can you give us an update on what is happening with the cell and gene therapies? I know this was big in 2022, and it's continuing to develop here in 2023. Sure, and I can kick it off, and Sue, you can hand, hand it over to you. So yeah, in, in cell and gene therapies, or in other parts of the world like Europe, they call it the ATMPs, things are continuing to evolve over the past 10, 15 or so years as things have been developing in that area, the industry is learning and the FDA is learning and other regulators are learning. So as we've seen over the past couple of years, either legislative changes or there's more guidance, like in the instance of the FDA, there's more guidance documents coming out to industry on expectations of what they want manufacturers and developers of, of these different biologic products to look at and adhere to. The other big aspect I think is it's personalized medicine at this point. So one patient, one drug. So, um, and it's not large scale manufacturing, like batch manufacturing at this point. So there's a lot of differences around that type of manufacturing versus our standard biologics or drug manufacturing. And also, I think at the same time, and Sue, I'm dropping a couple of different topics we could talk about, is also different things where over the past couple of years, we've seen some various cell and gene therapy companies here, specifically here in the United States, I have not got approval, whether they didn't have the development done according to what the FDA expectations were or around the safety aspect of drugs. So what, what do you think? Well, I think the, the issue of getting approval for these has to do with actually you have a variability coming in right off the bat in terms of your mm-hmm. active ingredient, which is the patient's genome. And so you're really looking at a process, a consistent process which takes anybody's uh, genetic material and produces their individualized therapy dose at the end. And that's what's very difficult. It's a non-traditional approval of a drug because it's based on individualized patients' genetic makeup. And you're looking at you know consistent steps throughout the process that will yield certain uh, parameters that are controlled by your specs. And that's very difficult when you have variable product coming in. You don't know exactly what you're working with up front. You have to categorize that and then walk it through the process and categorize at the end and make sure that it's uh, safe and effective for the patient, even though it's based on their own body genetic material. So I think it's a non-traditional thinking and it's hard to validate a process that has that kind of variability in it. But I think we're making breakthroughs on it. The regulators are much more in touch with how those processes work. We have to remember that they're small batches. We aren't talking about large manufacturing facilities. We're talking about laboratory, very small batches that are being produced in in laboratory type settings. Still with the same environmental controls, right? You still need to have the same environmental controls that you would have when you were producing aseptic processing, Right, but it's on a much smaller level. Yeah, you're right, Sue. And I've seen, especially with a lot of our clients we've had in this area, the valid the process validation. How do they do that? How do they do that adequately and so forth? The thing I've you know seen is also think about the supply chains different. So for instance, you know, standard personalized medicine for say you know, ATMP or a cell and gene therapy cancer product. You know, the blood is freeze from the patient, it's immediately put into on ice and it's either a courier or someone from the manufacturing site. FedEx or whatever will get that to the manufacturing site. They're going to put it directly into like a, to the freezer, so like a liquid liquid nitrogen freezer, uh, to preserve that product until it's time to actually manufacture. So the supply chain's a little bit different as well. I think the industry has definitely learned over the past five or so years, especially since that first approval was granted back in 2017, I believe, by the FDA, and then shortly after the EMA. So I think yeah, there's. A lot of learning, but a lot of learning to be had. With that first proof of concept, that one company got it back in 2017. Now you got a lot of investment in the area has come in. So I think the golden grail kind of of all the holy grail of all this is 
I think companies are starting to look, how can we do this, take it away from just one pro- one patient, one product? How can we get into like a batch manufacturer? So we see like back in the 80s and like where plasma companies would pull their plasma to make other products. That is going to be interesting to watch in the coming year and beyond how that works out and how the regulators kind of deal with that and how companies prove the product is going to be truly safe and effective. Yep. And I think we also have to acknowledge too, sometimes in this process, because you're working under critical time constraints to get that product manufactured and to the patient, you may be releasing or doing some releasing at risk. I think as an industry, we've struggled with that releasing. You might not know the final analytical result before you need to put it in the patient. And so that's always of concern. Yeah, it's clear to me that based on what you guys are saying, that personalized medicine is going to be a huge factor moving forward in the industry. And that kind of brings me to the next point of drug and device combination products for home and office use. Well, I think you're seeing with the devices, huge breakthroughs in some of uh, products being offered for home. So for instance, I, I saw on television advertised this Cardia Mobile device, which is an EKG, can do at your desktop and you just put your fingers on these pads and it sends the information directly to your doctor. Now that's just a device, but I think you'll see more and more combination products coming out, um, osteoporosis medicines, where you need to go into the clinic to get your shot once every month or your diabetes meds where people are going to want to do that at home. I'm sure that dialysis machines are you know, being slimmed down and and trimmed down and for home dialysis, where you're not going to have that big machine come carting into your house, you're going to have a smaller version of it. And I think these things are just going to continue to grow and evolve. Steve? No, I completely agree. I think, I mean, it's, it's an extremely exciting time being able to start doing this because, you know, from the aspect of if you have to go into the clinic to get the drug or, you know, go to the hospital or whatever, the thing has always been patient adherence to their treatment. I mean, for instance, if you have to go to a doctor's office every week, you're more often than not, depending on things, there's going to be times where it might be hard to get to that office. So this actually gets the, the product to the patient in a lot easier setting in their home. So, but it also leads to more risk. So, you know, around the, the device side, you know, it's the human factors. How do you make sure that they're doing that? Well, I think you touched on a really key issue, uh, Steve, and that is patient compliance. So if the patient's going into the doctor's office, there, there is that level of compliance that's verifiable. What these home health products and even these EKG machines, it's, it's measuring your compliance through the internet and the ability of that piece of equipment or that device or combination product to talk to the doctor to make sure that you're compliant with it. I think that's where this whole cybersecurity comes in. And we have to, you know, companies have to be very careful that they're producing, you know, hack proof products that are talking directly with the doctor. We know of instances in the past that where hospitals have been held Work their computer systems have been held in ransom by hackers, right? Pay me so much and I'll give you access back. So I think it becomes very important, this emphasis on cybersecurity and protecting the patient. I I think that's a huge challenge for uh, any of the device manufacturers and any of the combination product manufacturers. Also, at the same time, it's rolling into the drug manufacturers because it's not just, you know, single auto injectors that come in a pack anymore. You've got the issues of, say, like an implantable infusion pump. Uh, so, you know, mm-hmm. people that have diabetes, some of those have them, or like an implantable pain pump, infusion pump. Whereas before, like to get the, say, for instance, you, to get that refill, you'd have to go to the doctor's office, then they would, you know, do the, uh, the IT stuff in the doctor's office. But as we see, like in our, you know, Apple and Windows, we get software updates all the time. Well, you can't do that in the life science industry where if you decrease or increase, say, an insulin, it could have extreme detrimental effects or, you know, positive effects, depending on what it is to the patient. So how do they control that? So, you, so the security and safety of these products, it sounds like it's going to be the number one priority moving forward. It's definitely going to be interesting to see how the industry evolves, wrapping in that cybersecurity aspect into these products. Moving forward from there, there's been a lot of 
non-life science companies getting into the industry. And that just immediately starts throwing flags of future data integrity and compliance issues for these companies that haven't been in the space before. Do you guys have any thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. I can kick it off. So with, with, you know, you think about the different companies you, you see, we've all seen and heard in the news, like, you know, Mark Cuban's looking at this, you know, cause they're looking at the patient for, you know, especially around cost of drugs, Amazon, Google's getting into it. Other companies are getting into it as well. So number one, what are they doing? Are they, you know, for instance, just repackaging a drug and then what are the controls around that? Or are they actually thinking about manufacturing a drug, um, whether it be standard, you know, the standard kind of manufacturing like we do in pharmaceuticals and in biologics today, or is it going to be something like a 503B compounder and so forth like that? So with that, you think about you kind of step back into like the different, you know, the generations that are in the workforce nowadays. It's been in the news for almost a decade now, the, the amount of knowledge that is about to walk out the doors of companies not just the life science companies, but across you know all sectors of industry. So, how are companies number one retaining that knowledge, or how or how can they kind of if they haven't done a good job to date, how can they start looking at that and retaining that knowledge? Because you think about what has happened over like say the past twenty years. So, people that haven't lived through the Able Lab situation or the the Rambaxi situation in drugs or or what else through the. Uh, I'd say the heparin incident back in well, the I'd go back as far as the bar decision and the yeah. drug scandal. Exactly. So how can we learn how to how do we get the new generations to actually know and understand and learn from that so we don't repeat it in the future? Because going into these new these new companies coming in, coming into the life science industry, they don't have that knowledge either. They're executives. So like Mark Cuban, he has no, I mean, no idea. Hopefully, and surely Mark is surrounding himself. Like Google is hiring, has hired a lot of ex-FDA people I know. I mean, current commissioner actually was working at Google before he came back to the agency. So they're hiring the right people. So how do they get this lined up? But then you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of employees. How do you convey that knowledge to them? But it's not just conveying the knowledge. It's getting that understanding. Why is this important? You know, like data integrity issues. Yeah. Why is it important to have your data accurate, legible, you know, the Alcoas of the Alcoa and Alcoa Plus. Why is that important? What could happen? What has happened? And sometimes, I mean, my worry is, you know, you didn't live through it, you didn't feel that pain. So the, when the wound is gone and you still have a scar there, you kind of can remember it when you look down at the scar. We don't want to scar people, number one, but how do we get people to understand that? Sue, what do you think? I'm rambling here. Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, the issue is quite complicated in terms of there's a generation of us, uh, I include myself in that because I'm 65 and going to retire soon, that are leaving and we're taking with us institutional knowledge, or, or I should say sector pharmaceutical knowledge of things that have gone wrong in the past and why regulations came about. But I don't think it's just the industry the manufacturing side of the industry. I also believe the regulator side of the industry, there's a lot of those people that are ready to retire um, or are getting to that point where they might retire. So you kind of have this double hit. You have the industry focused personnel retiring, and then you have the regulator uh, people ready to retire. And with that, some of the reason why the bar decision happened and the testing into compliance and the underlying data integrity issues, it's it's going to leave unless we think of ways to pass it on. And that's the concern is that we'll repeat that history, that cycle again. In some ways, um, it's already being repeated if you look at the warning letters and the 483s issued to compounding 503B uh, compounders, which is the kind of the emerging industry segment, yeah. right? You can see that data integrity and um, testing into compliance or not testing, not having proper stability validation, smoke studies supporting the manufacturing of these products. You can see that repeating again, right? It's it's like a mini window into what we're in for in terms of an industry if we don't start passing on some of this institutional knowledge. Yeah, I think you're completely right. So it's specific to the 503Bs and even the 503As. If you think about during the pandemic, the agency kind of um, opened it up a little bit more 
were companies if the uh, you know the drug product was on the shortage list and there's guidances around this where they could compound an actual approved product which has been a pretty big no-no up until that point so i think the i call it the after effects of you know the pandemic putting more restrictions back into place but at the same time you have a lot of different companies entering that space now because it's a little bit easier to compound but also the 503b's compound a lot of product for multiple different clients so going back to the institutional knowledge me like living through the new england compounding company issue back in 20 or 2012 uh, where a compounding company, through not having good aseptic controls, killed and injured uh, almost a thousand people here in the United States. And, you know, th- those people, I mean, you got a lot of people still living with the after effects of that fungal meningitis issue or NACC. So, how can we prevent that? You know, I've seen a lot of our clients where uh, they, they're moving things along through a process and then, you know, say, you know, you need to do it like this, not that. So like a process validation or something, or even when by sticking with validation for a second where the validation documents just aren't as robust as you would see in a standard manufacturing company that's been doing this time and time again for years. Little things like that, those little things can add up to death and injury really quick. Now, going into the actual vaccine development, so cell and gene therapy, the the proof of concept idea. So, you know, with that aspect, mRNA technology is something that's been around for for quite some time now. And I think it's, you know, investors and so forth were looking for that first proof of concept. Unfortunately for the global population, that proof of concept came during the pandemic. I think that is why the vaccines were able to be developed so fast. They weren't developed, you know, outside of the rigor and controls of clinical trials, they were still held to all those things, which is why we have safe and effective vaccines on the market right now. But there's that proof of concept for that mRNA usage. That is coming around where there's now there's, you see more investment coming into the area. Different things are being developed. Uh, different vaccines are being looked at. The, the COVID vaccines, I mean, it, Sue can talk about this because we were talking about this the other day um, around how over time it's going to be similar to the, the flu vaccine and how things are changed because the different variants. But also at the same time, it's as more people are getting into it, it falls back into like we were talking about with all the other issues, the compliance issues. So you've got new players in the market, how are they going to assure that they're going to do it and make the product in a safe and effective manner? Going to the knowledge management and getting it's not just you know the new people that come in are the, the younger generations, but the older generations like myself help the younger generations assure that they're doing it right, not only under the eyes of the regulator, but also for themselves so they can have a sustainable business, but to do it right so they don't hurt people. Yeah, I think you hit on some key issues. And we have to remember, as you said, Steve, you know, historically the mRNA platform has been around since what 2010. It was really developed during the SARS outbreak, which did not become a pandemic. But what I think is interesting is you're going to see some older vaccines reformulated, uh, hopefully into using the mRNA platform. So for instance, with um, what's going on in the world in terms of global warming, we're seeing some of the what viruses, um, there's concern that some of the viruses, the older ones like a smallpox might come back. And we'll have to, you know, it'll it will need to revaccinate our population against smallpox because that's predicted to make um, to come back again. So, I think you'll see some of the older vaccines being reformulated with this new platform relatively quickly. Should that happen, I don't know, Steve. What do you think? I mean, that's that's what we've. Been oh, I agree here. with you. Yeah, and I, you know, also I think the other point is talking about the supply chain issues around different vaccines. So different war, extremely warm areas. And as you know, talk about global warming takes us to another level and more stable vaccines for warmer environments, because you look at the supply chain of these things and it, it happens in regular drugs too, and biologics where, you know, it might be controlled in the manufacturing facility and their, the way they store it. But once it's shipped, of course, then we have validated packages now where you know, it has to be validated to keep that temperature for a certain period of time, whatever the manufacturer says it has to be. But still, you got things where you get boxes and crates sitting on it like a tarmac. And an example I'll give you, and I heard from a client about three years ago, where you know it was a room temperature product, and it was a parenteral. So it was a liquid parenteral, but it sat on the runway in Denver, Colorado, here in the United States in February. 
that's cold time in Denver, as we all know. But because the sun was beating down on the tarmac all day, they had temperature excursions. Now, when the company got, you know, the temperature probes were red once it got to its final destination and realized they had a temperature excursion, I think there was a raised eyebrow like, oh, this got to be an aberrant data. There's no way we could have had a temperature, excur- temperature excursion. But they did some, you know, company did, their, uh, did a complete and thorough investigation um, and found out it truly was the cause. That, you know, in the middle of winter in Denver, Colorado, a box sitting on the tarmac never thought it would happen, but they had a temperature excursion and then they had to go back. And of course, they, in this case, they got rid of the product. But how do you prove that the product doesn't have you know, some deleterious effect happen from the temperature? So I think the supply chain issue is another aspect especially around you know, going back to our mRNA technologies um, as we get want to get more vaccines to more vulnerable populations that have historically not been able to get that vaccine or it's been hard to get the vaccine. The COVID's an example. We've been going into like, you know, poorer countries and so forth. And I've seen it where, you know, you've seen in the news where like the Gates Foundation or the Clinton Foundation or the Carter Foundation and foundations have found foundations that are trying to help these areas of the of the world um, are looking into that, and I think are actually starting to invest or are investing. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch. It's going to be interesting to watch and interesting to help companies because there's there's a lot of different variables. Again, going back to that knowledge management aspect, where the you know the older generations are going out, how do we help the newer generations make sure they do it right so we don't repeat the uh, problems of the past. I agree. I think um, the supply chain will become a huge issue as more and more vaccines. And let's face it, you know, this virus, uh, COVID's not going away. And I suspect that new viruses um, will come into play. And so we have to be able to solve the supply chain and also the manufacturing issues that we're facing in this relatively new platform. And not just, I mean, from the vaccine, but this mRNA technology can be used for other things. So I mean, what else What else can be used for? How can we use it? Like, for instance, you know, with the, uh, you know, antibiotics, people are worried about antibiotic resistant, you know, microbes. And, and yeah. rightly yeah. so, because people are dying. I mean, think about MRSA, the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and stuff like it's a, you know, problem in the hospital already. I mean, I just had, for instance, just personally, I was, just had surgery a couple months ago. And I had to get a MRSA test before the MRSA. I had to get a MRSA test before I had surgery to make sure I didn't have it because if I had it, it added all kinds of different complications for the doctor afterwards. So this kind of mRNA technology, can it be used for this for this type of area where you can develop new antibiotics or new antimicrobials for patients? Because um, right now we have a pretty big gap where the you know our standard antibiotics have been around for decades. And unfortunately, companies have cut their their anti anti infection areas over and over again. So now they're starting to put money back into it because now all of a sudden it's turn, turning into a huge public health issue globally. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. The one final thing we got to wrap it up here. I wanted to ask you both: what would be a piece of advice you would give to the uh, younger generation coming into the life science industry? Just kind of to touch back on to that cultural shift around retiring. You know, I would personally connect with some of the older staff and try to learn about some of the history to understand. The younger people coming in have very different perspective in terms of communication styles and stuff, but I don't think that should just that should prevent them from talking to people who have lived through the bar decision, the generic drug scandal, Rambaxi, and from learning from that. Because even though we're more in a digital age or more internet, um, some of the concepts that were evolved from those instances in the industry. Um, are still pertinent even in an interconnected internet world. I completely agree with you, Sue. I think, you know, you see a lot of companies putting these, men, you know, either, either have or they're trying to bolster or they're trying to put in new mentoring or coaching programs in their company for these for these specific reasons. But also, you know, for the younger generations, don't just rely on everything you've read or in a book or had a class on talking to people and actually, you know, you get, you got the theoretical, but then you got the practical application of things. And, you know, sometimes you can't put everything into a book. So yeah, please don't ask, ask the older generation, older company, older folks that have been around for a while or find that mentor that can help you. And just, I mean, I've done a lot of mentoring in my life as Sue has, 
I think I'd step it up a notch too and challenge the companies that as people are beginning to retire, make sure you're spending a, an appropriate amount of time. So for instance, the president of the PDA is retiring in February and we've had the replacement um, president working with him over the last year to understand that institutional knowledge for PDA. I, I would challenge companies to make sure that there's enough time as you bring on the new staff, the, uh, the other staffs retiring, that you leave enough time for those conversations and that type of mentoring to happen. It's not just a two week, okay, I'm retiring in two weeks, I'm gone, Joe's taken my spot. It's a broader conversation over a longer period of time. Well said. Thank you both for giving that advice, um, especially for somebody being in that uh, newer generation in the field. That means a lot for me. Um, and I want to, again, thank you both for taking the time to go over what's happening in the pharma industry in 2023 and providing us with each of your valuable insights into the matter. And I want to thank our listeners, too, for tuning into this episode of RCA Radio. Be sure to subscribe to be the first to know when we upload the next episode of RCA Radio. Thanks again and have a great day.